All right, let's get going. Uh, the topic for today is JavaScript patterns. Um, kind of the motivation behind this was like the, uh, what is it, the original Gang of Four, is that what it's called? All right, yeah. Um, that, and there was a, a book by uh, Addy Asmondi a, a couple of years ago released that kind of applies it to JavaScript, which not surprisingly isn't really used that much anymore, like patterns have changed. But I kind of wanted to take the ideas of what the patterns, certain patterns in that book solve and kind of compare it to what like practices now do in JavaScript. Um, that kind of solve the same similar set of problems, um, but kind of, uh, kind of more natural to what you're going to find in the JavaScript community. Okay, So I think before, kind of a, what, what kind of is a fundamental game changer, I think, than other, other languages in JavaScript is that we have uh, plain old JavaScript object literals. And I can't think of another language that has that. Um, I did some Googling. C, C Sharp kind of has it. But let me know if you know of any others that have it. Perl. Perl has it? Cool. Cool. All right, so based on, based on that, I mean, there's some uh, all dynamically uh, dynamic languages. I don't, I don't. I don't know what it is, but there, it's. It seems to be a rare, a rare thing, a rarer thing. Okay. So in JavaScript, if you wanted to create an object that shaped like this that describes my first car, right? We literally just do that. Right. This should be anyone who's written JavaScript is probably pretty familiar with this. So what about methods if you're into that sort of thing, right? It's the same thing, right? You just you literally define it right there in line, okay? So this, this might seem basic, but kind of if you think about it, the ability to create objects literally anywhere without first having to define a class is, is kind of fundamentally different. So I mean, I, I think we do this every day, pretty much in JavaScript, but, but uh, probably don't really kind of think about how that might shift the paradigm a little bit. So then I ask, is JavaScript like literally more object oriented, right? Because there's not really a class, everything's an object. So it seems probably like more object oriented than other things. So, food for thought. All right, so that's, that's how we create an object, right? <laughs> but in JavaScript, what if we wanted to create a, a bunch of objects that have this shape, right? This is kind of where classes come in in other languages, right? So we can create, this is kind of the, the, the traditional approach. We can create this constructor function, and it takes some arguments, and based on those arguments, it just says this, whatever equals that kind of thing, which can be very dangerous, right? Um, because if you forget to use new, it's gonna it's gonna kill your global space, right? But to use it, you would basically do my first car equals new car. You do that. My second car equals new car. This is kind of again very kind of fundamental. Second option we have now is we can have a class, right? This is newer. This is a class in parentheses, let's say, or quotations. Um, it's not really a class. There still aren't really classes in JavaScript. But it's just a way of, of quickly creating an object of the same thing, right? And this is an ES6 feature. And then the format looks almost identical to the last one, right? when you want to create a, a new object. Same thing. So why is that not a class? JavaScript doesn't have an idea of classes, really. It's still a prototypal, prototypal inheritance. Right. So you inheritance in JavaScript means you are pointing to other objects. There is no idea of like an abstract class type of thing. If that makes sense. So, so the the other option, which kind of is the, getting to the title of this column of slides. So in JavaScript, we can literally create a new object anywhere. Right. We said that literally a few slides ago. And this is someone's quote on the internet, which means it's true. In JavaScript, any function can return a new object. When it's not a constructor function, that first thing we showed you, or a class, it's called a factory function, right? 
So here's, a fact, here's that same thing in a factory type of pattern. It's basically a function that accepts arguments, returns an object. And your, your usage is almost like the other one, except for you don't do new car, you just say create car. Right? The end result of all three of these things are pretty much identical in practice. You don't, there's no special types. It's all just a plain old ob JavaScript object. So all, all three methods pretty much produce the same thing in practice. There's some nuance, but... So kind of compare the three formats. Right, there's the constructor, function, a class, and a factory. Make sense? Questions or comments about that? Observations? So is there, in what situations would you use one versus another? It's a good question. Um, save that for like two columns from now, and then I'll ask you if I answered it. OK. All right, so another pattern we come across is object composition. Anyone want to take their, uh, take, be daring and define that? Anyone? I can, I can wait awkwardly. Thanks. Basically, you have a bunch of different objects that contain things that are that might be either generally useful or useful to a specific range of objects, say you have a car or something like that. A car can honk a horn or something like that. And all cars are, are going to honk a horn. Instead of creating a base object or a base <coughs> class or a base prototype from which all of those cars inherit, you just merge either links, like references to those methods uh, into one object Basically taking a bunch of objects and mixing them together like you would with the mix-in, something like that. Very good. So Wikipedia says, a way to combine simple objects or data types into more complex ones. I think that's what you said, pretty much. So for example, in JavaScript, let's say we have a bunch of simple objects and they're shaped like this. Right? We have this teenage thing, maybe a, a mutant, how about, how about a ninja, and a turtle. I don't know, just kind of came to me. Right, And you want to take these things and you want to create a new object based on that that looks like this. right? So this is essentially object composition. So this is how you do it. <laughs> no, seriously, that's how you do it. Right. right, so there you go. You want to compose objects together. Here we're defining a new object literal because we can literally create objects anywhere, right? And we are basically, this is like a merge type of function. We're spreading out the properties of each of these objects into a new object. Is, is that supported? A, that's a stage, so you will need a build set up, a pipe, kind of a, a work, ideally you already have one, but a, um, like Babel or something to that effect. Stage three feature is what it's called. So JavaScript, to get a uh, feature in a language, it goes through four stages and then adoption. Well, five if you count stage zero, but you know. Um, so it, it's, it's very commonly used. I would, I would add this, I would add a, uh, a build system just to use this feature because it, it, <coughs> it will simplify your code. Is it, is it similar to object.assign? That's a good question. If you don't want to do that, you can use object.assign, which is in everything but IE. So Edge has it, um, and you can. it's easy to polyfill if you still wanted to use it. I, out of the two, I would definitely just recommend using a starter that has this enabled already, or enable it in your starter. Yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll really simplify your code. Questions or comments about that? Object composition? What do you guys think? Can you merge um, stuff that has function and other stuff too? I yep. It, it's a shallow copy is what it's called. So one level. If you want to go deeper than that, then you'll have to kind of do some tricks to go deeper than that. How does it handle collisions? Like if both teenage and youth had, a, had the same field or same function? The one on the, the last one wins. So here... If, <laughs> If turtle redefined age to 35, then it'll be middle-aged mutant ninja turtle. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it's true. Any other questions or comments about this? All right. Mixins. Who knows what that is? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so the ability to take um, <clears throat> function methods and, and uh, properties from one class and bring them into another. I like that you air quoted class because I pretty much do that on the next slide. <laughs> Good. Although they're, not, they're, they're actually strike throughs, but close enough. Classes, which offer functionality that can easily uh, can be easily inherited by a subclass or a group of subclasses for the purpose of function reuse, right? So basically, we we want to inherit some behavior essentially uh, on more than one object on a set of objects. So and this is this is like. Factory composition, if you think about it, right? We want to take all these things that create objects and merge them together into a new thing that creates objects based on the other things that create objects. Good? So here you go. We want, to, we want the next big idea from Hollywood. We want to create the next TMNT, right? Here, here is that concept. So we're defining a function that returns an object it spreads over the results of a factory, which returns an object, four times. Questions about that? We just hang out here for a second. Everyone's still kind of dialed into that slide. Yep? So you're creating an object with the sum of four functions? I'm creating a function that, when executed, produces an object which is the composition of the result of four other factories, right? So these, these four pieces, right, aren't specific to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle clone, right, or knockoff. We could use a random age bracket anywhere. That could be useful in, in multiple use cases. Each one of these, these things, right? But when we compose them together in this way, we get an opinion, a, a kind of a, a more opinionated result back out. But there's a, a lot of reuse involved in this idea. Does that, does that make sense? I'm guessing this is stage three as well. The dots, yeah. You could, you could uh, same idea. You could mimic this with object assign. Questions, comments? Correct. So the, the comment was none of these have any parameters or arguments coming in, right? But you could do that. Like you can have this outer one basically delegate which arguments go where, right? So you could like pass in the age. It wouldn't be a random age bracket, it would be the passed in age bracket. Yeah, if there were some like range or parameters we would have wanted to put on that thing. Yep. We good? All right. Decorators. Who wants to describe this? Anyone? All right. I won't, I won't be awkward this time. Okay. <clears throat> Allows behavior to be added to an individual object, right? <clears throat> This is from Wikipedia. Either statically or dynamically without affecting the behavior of other objects from the same class. Right? So kind of similar to our last column, but that dealt with kind of the generation of a bunch of things. This is just decorating objects that already exist that won't affect um, any other object that has a similar shape. Right? With me? Want to guess what operator we use here? Any guesses? So here's my translation of that, right? Jared Anderson translation. Append data or behavior to an object, right? So here's a one-off decoration. <clears throat> Taking any object and we're making it better. Or actually a specific object. In this case, whatever is assigned to OBJ. And we're making that particular object better. Baconizer. Yeah. Well, one-off. 
So not as good as the next slide, then. Right? Does that make sense? All right. How about in a, like in a factory type of thing? We want to make anything better than before. All right? Give me an object and I'll make it better than it was before. Questions or comments about this? Yep. Uh, it would be the same thing if the object coming in had bacon equals true. Yes. Yeah. This would override that. Do you want to define the same? Because it wouldn't be the same. Same shape, different memory reference. So if you placed um, the decoration before the actual object and the object overwrote that, it wouldn't really be beneficial? Correct. Okay. So yeah, depending, the order here matters down below where you're doing that merge. So. Um, yeah, use that to your advantage, however you're wanting to do that. So whenever you do the spread on object right there, did you say it's actually creating a new <coughs> reference in memory mm -hmm. you do this? Yes. It's, it's essentially a copy of them and then return the copy. Or it's a shallow copy. Mm -hmm. Does it, let's say that object um, has nested children, oh. are those getting put into new pieces of memory or is it just no. pointing to them? They would just point to them. So. Cool. Unless it doesn't pass by reference, like or string. Yeah. So, yeah, there's some nuance there. But the idea is it's going to take a shallow copy, which means just one layer of depth, and just copy it straight over, kind of giving you a semi immutability there. But if one of those things you're copying over is an object that's very deep, it just it copies over just that first level, and the pointers to those other things remain. If you wanted to not mutate, if you wanted to mutate the one coming in, yeah. So yeah, if you wanted kind of a more like a mutate, a mutable pattern, a mutable pattern, then yeah, that's what you do. Um, I would unless you need to do that, I would encourage this though. Yeah. That would also make it not a decorator anymore because the definition of the decorator was you take the original object, you don't modify it at all, create a new object that is modified just for that specific. And also, this is a good demonstration of how the concept of a prototype. I mean, the object is your prototype. You create a new uh, object based on that prototype and then extend it further. Correct. Although, here it's uh, everything is flat contained within yeah. this object. No prototype will inheritance, but it's Correct. being used as a prototype. Yes. So, is the difference between extending this and doing a decorator to it is the decorator returns a new version of it while extending it is still the same one, but you mutated it? Uh, yeah, I think it depends on how you define decorating, honestly. So the original object reference is still available and it is not mutated. In this case. In this case. And uh, you, it returns a reference to a new object that has the mutation. Correct. Which is definitely the, the way I, what I would recommend unless you need <clears throat> that same memory reference. And you just goes. Yes. And you like paint. Questions or comments? More questions or comments? These are good. Anything else? Move on. Okay. Oh, inheritance, my favorite. So, warning, opinions. Okay. So this is an opinion. It's commonly shared depending on how you define this, right? But prefer composition over inheritance. So, I think that's com that's that that idea is commonly shared but there's nuance on what that exactly means in practice. Okay. In general here, I would recommend the last column of slides over this column. Okay. So create a new copy, use composition, use factory composition. Um, that's, gonna, that's what I would recommend doing. When you can't, because there are times where you can't or where it doesn't make sense, you want to prefer shallow inheritance. Don't create big giant trees of inheritance, lots of generations. Keep it simple, one generation, right? And that was, that's when composition's not feasible. There's use cases where you want to do this. Why would you prefer shallow? Because 
Lots of reasons, but they all basically boil down to velocity. So when you have complex hierarchies, it's going to slow you down. No one wants to fight over these slides? I was kind of worried. So here's an example of classes, but not really classes. And a couple of use cases where you're going to see this. Button extends React component, widget extends HTML element. These are things in which th this pattern makes sense. I wouldn't create button that extends link that extends React component. Right? Keep it. Keep that inheritance tight, shallow. Surprised no one's mad at this. Sweet. I should have gone more. All right. Closures. Who wants to find this one? I don't believe it's kind of a harder one, right? Okay. Uh, let's let's see how MDN does it, which is very wordy. Okay. <laughs> Closures are functions that refer to independent free variables, variables that are used locally but defined in an enclosing scope. In other words, these functions remember the environment in which they were created. We good? Skip this whole slide now, right? <laughs> Hi, me. Good. Yep. So, if I had to like summarize this, I'd just say closures never forget. Okay. Good. <laughs> All right. I think this is very hard to like just define until you have to kind of see examples of it. All right. So, curring, which I'm going to show you what that is, is an example or exemplifies a closure. Okay. <coughs> so let's take a look what's happening here. Here we're creating a function called create secret container that is it, it accepts an argument called secret it creates a new function and it returns that new function and if you look at the body of that new function what is it referencing which where which is defined where right so this is basic this is it at a kind of a very fundamental level right and like right here, it kind of looks obvious, like, oh, well, yeah. But when you do this, oops, I'm sorry, not this, that's the next this. So you have the inner and the outer. The inner function has access to the outer function scope. Okay? So example, my secret container is we're, we're, we're executing that original thing, passing in that thing, right? What, what is now my secret container? What is it? A function, right? So kind of outside the original scope, it feels like, right? So my, my secret container is the returned inner function, right? See this part right here? Can you see my mouse? Right there. That inner one. And it still remembers, even so right now, we're outside of that context, it still remembers the secret that was defined in that outer scope. With me? Yep, should we try it? S same exact, can you, how's the font size? Good. So if I uncomment this, what should it be? What about this? What, what is it going to say down in the console? What about this? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I swear I finished this not this morning. So I'll, like these are kind of pieces trying to help explain the concept. Are they doing that? 
How about, are they not doing that? Raise your hand. Sort of. Why would you use this? There's a number of reasons, and we'll kind of show the most common reason in like three slides. So same thing I said before. If I haven't answered it in like three columns, let me know. So here, uh, Jaime said they're basically adding state to functions. Do you see how we added state? Right? So this thing right here is a function that has, has state. The value of secret, right? Because it because it remembers this outer scope. So this is a thing. This is a thing, right? Two separate functions. So this thing I'm highlighting right now is this. When executed, still remembers that it was created in this context out here. Maybe um, can we like rewrite this in a way that would be a way that would be wrong? Yeah, like, show us what we're gaining. Is there a way that you could rewrite this? Yeah, let me, let me, I have another example. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> okay, let's look at this. So here, counter is a function that accepts an argument called number. It returns an object. The contents of that object are functions that, when executed, interact with that original argument coming in. With me? See it? Run it? Talk about it? Boring? <laughs> All right. <coughs> so down here, if I uncomment this, what's going to happen? Right? Do you want to walk, walk through the code? Or, or are we good? Okay. So, right here, can you see when I highlight? Yeah, you can see it. Okay. What if you change the number to something else? If I change this? No, your constant number below. Then all, all of these would reflect that same thing. So, that would be if this was a one, then down here would be straight ones all the way across. Right? Okay. Because right now, each of these functions are enclosed in a scope that it always remembers. And in this scope, number is defined, right? So val is a function that just returns number. Hang on, Jaime, one second. So it's returning a private version. So it's returning an object. So it's like a private property, right? Hi, Mia. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, I was wondering if he's asking what happens if you set number. If number was not const, and you set number <coughs> after. So you created the two counters and then set number. Is that what it's being asked? Or I'm, I'm not sure, but I purposely use const to demonstrate behavior here in a second. Right? Const means it can't change, right? Sort of. Yes? Within a scope, that's true. Okay, so again, counter is a function that accepts a parameter that should be an integer, right? It returns an object containing functions. Each function, when executed, is the value that it returns is derived from that original thing passed in. 
or not return, but basically how it operates. Yep, I mean, was that a hand? Well, just, if they're wondering about, the number is passed into the counter, but the number is passed into the counter by value. So the number that is inside the counter object is a different copy of the number that the cons outside. Correct. It is not cons. Correct. With me, should we go on? So if I do this, what am I going to get? Right? How about this one? With all these things still highlighted, right? Is it? So I heard zero, one, negative one. What was that? Someone say that again. I heard zero, two, negative two. So the same, right? I didn't do any. I didn't change anything. How about this one? Everyone, everyone getting that? So we've essentially, basically in a classical inheritance type of situation, we have private, a private property that we mutate through public methods. This is that same idea. So at the very top um, of your functions, we would have the uh, number equals zero as the parameter. But, so that equals zero <coughs> is only affected on that first time it's called. This number, this is scoped, this whole scope right here is a different scope than this. Yeah, but in the parameter yeah. of counter, okay. we have number equals zero, so that equals zero is not reset every time it's called. Equals so zero, default, 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 So what you get back when you call this the first time is an object, right? An object with now private variables that you cannot access directly, that you cannot mutate directly. Does that make sense? And then if you wanted to expose a way to do that, you do so by, ex by exporting functions that have access to that privileged scope that you do not have access to. Okay? That makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Is it? I mean, could you access that value of this private as four one dot number? Nope. So, this from here to here, you can see that highlight is what score one and score two essentially the structure of that is. Has no 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 other access to that number. You cannot you cannot see it. You cannot change it unless there is a something to find in that object that lets you do that. What would happen if you took out the function mixing numbers and on this function and just did it? So if I return just number, then yeah, then it then it's now basically a public property. Is that what you're asking? If one of the object properties right, was number? So if thou was just talking <coughs> on this function and just had thou, you know, you know so, Mm -hmm. So that would be a public property. That pro that would that would be. Uh, it wouldn't modify a number when you just call it increment decimal because numbers pass by value, not by reference. So Correct. You have val equal to the initial value of the number, but number would still change independent of val. And every time you call val, you would just get the original value of the number. You wouldn't get the latest value of the number. No, because it's passed by value, not by reference. We can see it's set by value as well. On yeah. We can we can see if you want to see, yeah. um, but let's finish what we got here real quick. We're good with all this, <laughs> right? So if all this went according to plan, down here this should be true, yeah. See, I write unit tests all the time. Proof right there. 
Okay, so you want to see what happens when we do this. Run. So, basically, your pointers are off. So you just got bumps for scrubs or scrubs. Uh. Good. All right, let's move on. We have a little, do a little more. All right, so that's a, that's kind of a fundamental idea that some other things coming up is based off of. All right. So closures are common in many uh, functional type type of languages, um, and they're also they're common in JavaScript, which is kind of multi paradigm. Okay. Who wants to describe an iffy? Why do you do it? So that you can immediately invoke a function. <laughs> why, would, why would you want to do that? <laughs> to scope things. Scope. Okay. So a function that runs as soon as you define it. Right? So it's useful for encapsulating scope, also known as privacy. Right? Here's an example of what that looks like. I'm not going to run this one, but type of n would be what? Undefined, right? So right in here, so JavaScript is function scoped, asterisk, and in here we're saying var, which basically when you declare a var, that var exists in in inside its entire function scope, right? But down here, this is a different scope. So if we were to do this, it would, it would do console.log, so we'd have one and then undefined. That would be the result of running that. Does that make sense? So this is a foundational concept, but generally we don't we don't author the we don't write this way. We don't need to anymore. Okay. The reason why is we have uh, block scoped options now. So constant let variables there are block scoped <coughs> as opposed to var. Okay. I'll do a quick demo there so you can see. Part partially yes. Um, so here, right, we, inside of a block, we say var x, var, or const y, let z, and then we log this in the block. Then outside the block, we do type of, because that's safer than trying to call things directly when they don't really exist. And we have two different, right? So we have x, y, z, and then outside the block, x is still available to us. But y and z aren't. Got it? So JavaScript is function and block scoped and dynamic. Ah, okay. The other way we can get privacy is now is with modules, which we'll talk about. We gotta get a little quicker, I think. Okay, the module pattern. This is different than the mod, uh, modules that are part of the spec now, okay? So the fundamental idea of a module pattern in JavaScript is the idea of combining a couple of these concepts we just talked about together. That iffy <coughs> idea, right? The closure, 
we had the closure where we had these these functions that have access to a private kind of privileged um, a privileged scope and it's combining these two things together right so here kind of step through this we're creating an iffy right here's the iffy immediately invoked function expression down here right and we're doing that to encapsulate scope now anything defined within there stays within there sort of right so we define those private variables p1 p2 yes we return an object containing functions that remember the variables p1 and p2. We take all that and we assign it to a variable called game, which, which is now uh, pointing to this object that we returned, right? So if we want to interact with this, we do game.p1 scored. Right? It's very simple, like kind of the same idea where game is an object. With me? We want, you want to see that? Just quick. A new window. Oh, is there a shortcut to playing? So here's the same, same exact code. We tally that, 0, 0, 0, right? We're going to say these events happened. P1 scored 2, P2 scored five or 3, and P1 scored 2. These don't return anything currently. That's why we're not seeing any, anything there. But if we tally that now, Scores four to three, and then we can reset that. Zero zero. So this is kind of a understanding. This will really help you understand um, ES six modules and how they work. How they're different than just an include of a library, right? Immediately invoked function expression um, is just defining and executing a function right away. Do you want to show in the syntax what causes the execution? <coughs> so here's the, this from here, well, let's go back to this slide because it all fits. Okay. So from here to there is just a function, right? It's so a function that return, re, there's some, some operations that happen in there that then return an object. <coughs> we turn that into an expression. So that's this ending with that, right? So if I were to take that and do a console.log, what would that evaluate to? A, a function, right? So now th that's a function that we then execute immediately. So it's like nope. Kind of looks, it looks like it, right? Yeah. yeah. So it is just not occurring because it's not passing. It's not occurring because it's not a function returning a function per se. Like it's an, an expression that contains a function that gets executed, which returns an object. What's the advantage versus? So what we have right now is game is a separate, it's like a module that can be shared and used, right? It's a live thing. It has state. Yeah, I mean. So the most important thing that happens right here is that a new scope is created. Right? A new scope is created with that function. And that scope keeps all the stuff in that scope private to that scope. Accessible only through the methods that are exposed or exported. So that's why you do this, because you want you want private scope. Correct. 
So to, to reiterate, hang on one second, I got you. Reiterate, we're creating a new scope. In that scope, we define variables. Those variables are in a, they cannot be accessed from the outside, right? We, we export out functions that when, we, when they're executed have access to that privileged scope. So it's just privacy. So basically it's the difference if you were compared to Java or C++. It's, if you were to just create an object with, you know, just the curly brackets, P1, you know, let P1, or create the P1 and create the P2, those would be public equivalent, but doing it this way, it basically makes P1 and P2 private. Correct. And access those directly because of this level of indirection. Correct. I don't know about the last comment, but yes. Besides the internet, inter yes. That's essentially what's happening. Correct. Any other comments there? So again, this is another foundational concept. It's good to understand, but you don't write things this way anymore. Or you don't need to. I mean, you can, but you don't need to. Okay. I'm just kind of showing you that to kind of basically I want to build up to this next slide is our modules, right? This is part of the spec now. Kind of take that same idea last time where it kind of feels a little awkward depending on your background. It probably feels really awkward, right? And make it less awkward and more, more declarative, less indirection, right? So now we're in a file. We're in a file called game.js. I don't know if you can read that down at the bottom. And here in this file, in this module, we're declaring a couple of variables, P1 and P2. This module has its own scope, right? Its own runtime almost. I want to get that way, like its own. It's a live thing, okay? And in this file, in this module, um, we, we're also exporting out four functions, those same <coughs> ones. P1 scored, P2 scored, tally, and reset. And the contents of those functions refer to the outer variables that we've defined, right? So it's almost kind of the same idea as we did last time. So then we have our app.js file, and it's importing file one, which we'll look at that real quick. Here we're importing all the things that are exported out of game.js, okay? And here we're first we're doing a game.tally. And we're doing those P1 score two, P2 score three, tally reset. And then at the very end we do one more thing. We call P1 score two one more time, right? I just do that just to kind of show a, a, an idea here. Here's file two. Now we're importing only two things, tally and P2 scored. We don't care about the other ones because we're not going to use them, okay? Here we go, P2 scored five, and then we do a tally. All right, so my question would be, what's the final tally? If that whole thing runs, what's, what's the final result if we console.log that? So tally is going to give you an array of first argue, first item in the array is the P1 score. Second is the P2 score. 2-5? Two, five. Two, five? You'd have two different arrays, wouldn't you? Uh, so I'm asking you. I don't know. Because well, the, the game module doesn't create a new object for you. It just returns the game object, which then references P1 and P2, which are essentially, they're global to game. They're not global to the entire application, it's just yes. within the game file. It's and like so because of that, whenever you modify them, they change for any instance of game that you're using throughout the application. So we have two separate, I think the core tricky part here, we have two different files importing the same module, right? What is it, is it importing a library or is it importing a thing? That exists in memory already. So we have two different files. They're both importing the same thing, the same module, game, right? So the fundamental question is, is it just importing a library, a unique kind of copy idea, or are we importing a live thing? 
Is it a static library inclusion? Or is it, are you importing a thing that lives in memory? <laughs> you think, but uh, it's it's a, it's a uh, yeah it, it's a live thing. It's in memory. So if you to take this, which this links to, uh, so for modules resolve depth first. Here's my entry point. File one JS. Let's go there. This imports game, which gets this right. Does a bunch of stuff. Tally, it adds two. Can you read that? That's pretty small. So it's kind of the same idea, but we're logging stuff out. That's the, that's what file one does. Then we go back to our entry point. Then it says, okay, now grab file two. File two grabs tally and P2 score. This is the sequence of events this is actually happening in. Okay. Then it's saying P2 scored five, and it's logging it out. So the, the trick question is, is it five, two? Or five zero, right? And here I, I took that and I download. I'm going to run it, right? It's two to five. So this is fundamentally different than a lot of other language where you're just it, it, what you import is a static thing. This is a live thing living in memory. I think here and then there. I was just going to say I think an important thing to kind of wrap your mind around it is to remember the fact that import and export actually aren't even supported in the browser. Supported in Node natively, um, maybe not yet, but I don't remember. But um, modules in and of themselves are not supported in a browser yet. Um, well, there's two browsers that are supported in. Oh, they are. Okay. Yeah. Well, essentially, what they're doing is, I mean, a module is a convenient, an organizational convenience for you and your project. It's it's not changing fundamentally how things work. It's just making it so that you can approach your projects in a more efficient organizational manner. That's true if you understand how it works is each file or module is more than just a static library you include, right? But you're, which the, the fundamental thing to understand here is that you're importing essentially memory space of things that have already executed, right? With me? Sort of? I'm not convinced. So summarize, modules are like importing an iffy module. Yep, go ahead. Lyle. That's not the question. Um, this one is, uh, is it, the reason why it's doing that memory is because the entry point has a result. It's not entry point, 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 it's not Fundamentally how it works is it goes depth first. One file includes game, then executes the result of that, right? right. Then the next thing imports, which also imports game. And it's bringing in game in the state that that first one left it in, because it's a live thing. It's, well, yeah, one process. Correct. So yeah, this on each different process, it's going to, each process will have its own run scope, yes. So, Depend. It, it depends. Yeah. So what are the? I guess. Uh, do we also the benefits and cons of that? Um, if you need state, if you need member state, and you want to share it, do it that way. But in your module, you can export out stateless functions and have it act like a library. It can it can serve both purposes. So the only way, the only reason why it's over in memory is because that module is created as the way all modules are created that way. All mod all modules are Correct. If you have a scope, if you have module-based scope right, meaning that all functions within there have access to it, then you have basically module-based scope. You don't have to author it that way. Like P1 and P2, you don't have to define. And then you can just export out pure functions that are stateless. And then you can have a more library type idea. Or you can export out a class. So, and I'm assuming it does, but does that hold in native implementations? Yes. Webpack is just a part of it. Correct. The difference is I, the things that are returned out of a module natively are frozen. Question. Any other questions before we move on? I, we're almost we are out of time. I got two more that are fast. I promise. Just really quick question: Is it useful to think of what you just demonstrated for us, the CS6 module pattern, 
I keep going back to like the singleton pattern. And Similar to that, that idea. Kind of same. Okay. Yeah. Right. Similar. Yep. And if you anyone worked in Node, that's how common. That's how Node does it too. Common JS as well. So. <coughs> so a facade pattern. Briefly, it's basically hiding the ugly details, right? Like we have this big gross code that has like. I don't know, maybe it's hard. We don't want we want to protect the rest of the world from having to interact with it. Okay. So say just use modules, right? Like here, inside of a module, we're importing complex thing A, B, and C from these local files. And what we're exporting out is a function that looks at what's coming in, and based on that, ex executes the appropriate private thing within there, right? This is the facade pattern. Just use a module. Mod modules, like there's a nuance there, but they, they, they actually solve a number of, of, of patterns. So. All right, uh, we're out of time. I'm looping, these are quick. Uh, in, in JavaScript, here's, here's a little chart that's probably 99% accurate, okay? In JavaScript, why are you looping? Well, if you have to break, use a for loop, okay? If you want to remove items, use the dot filter method. If you want to adjust items, use dot map. That's adjusting each item potentially. <coughs> you want to execute something on each of these. Use mapper for each. Otherwise, it's probably reduce. Yeah, and we did a donuts. We've done a number of donuts on this, so we'll we'll post these if you want to learn more about that. We've probably done three at least I can think of. And also maybe a sword talk too. And then async, I'm going to briefly, like JavaScript has the idea of async, which is foreign to, depending on your background, maybe foreign. Um, and it's basically the idea of allowing other processing to continue before, before uh, instead of spinning up new threads and waiting for that thread, the operation on that thread to continue before moving on, the idea is let processing continue. And um, when that's done, it'll kind of come back to it. And with that behavior, there's some awkward things that you're going to see in JavaScript, like callbacks, promises, uh, async await, and then observables coming, maybe. Okay. Um, same thing. We've also done a donuts about this. Um, but generally, those are the type of, you're going to be interacting a lot with callbacks and, and probably promise-like behavior at this point in time. And that's the end. All right. Sorry to keep you over. Uh, you're free to leave. Also free to ask questions if you have any, or come up and chat either way. Uh, I've recently started to like to use some instead of four loops. Some but just some a will break. Can I use a quick question? Sure. I saw that in your objects you were doing just functions, like function parentheses then curly braces. Is that a well, shorthand? Do whatever operation you want. Um, like instead of doing like. So oh, my function colon, and then you define function. <coughs> it's yeah, it's shorthand. There's also some nuance on the scoping. Um, let me stop recording real quick.